Hi, Julie. Hey there. From Ukraine, the footage of crowds of terrified refugees sheltering in train stations is eerily familiar. Cell phone footage shows apartments rattled by nearby explosions looking just like the one I grew up in, down to the Persian rug and crystal ashtray on the coffee table. My 91-year-old and my grandfather spent 61 years of their lives in the Soviet Union, where they suffered through workers, hunger, and cold living conditions and levels of oppression, discrimination, and persecution that are unfathomable to those of us fortunate enough to live in the United States in this day and age. 26 of our relatives were buried in Babi Yar. How many children will die, my grandmother keeps asking. This is just like when the, Nazi came. the Nazis came. We were saved because we were evacuated, but who will save them? There's nowhere to go. Millions of lives are on the line because an authoritarian maniac wants to rebuild the horrible country we escaped. But in America, our memories and attention spans are short. College kids wear kitsch Soviet Union t-shirts or CCC pins like it's cool. And this isn't new. Back when I was in art school, I blocked at a fellow student who walked into class in a KGB t-shirt. KGB, perhaps her Gestapo t-shirt was in the laundry. But can you blame her? Stalin and communism were barely mentioned in my grade school curriculum in suburban Chicago. I can't shake the feeling now that the world has changed. It is the same way I felt walking in downtown Chicago the morning of September 11, 2001, looking up at the sky and wondering if any planes were coming. We live in the most powerful country on earth, and yet here we are looking on impotently, not knowing how to help those in harm's way. I implore you, don't look away. Don't put a, a Ukrainian flag on social media and forget all about it. When someone somewhere uses the wrong language or posts the wrong next tweet, don't be distracted by the outrage bandwagon. This is reality now. When you take your kids to soccer practice this weekend, remember that Ukrainian kids were playing soccer last weekend too. When you kiss your kids goodnight, think of the fathers in Kiev kissing their kids before leaving to fight for their freedom. And when the news cycle moves on, remember that the world has changed. What we pay attention to matters. A dictator has changed the rules of the game and he wants us to be distracted and look away. We mustn't let him win. This was also first published in the Times of Israel in, in fact, February 25th. Oh, thank you. Thank you sharing that. I, I, know I saw a very disturbing image. You know, images are very powerful. Mm -hmm. There was a picture of a young child that on the back, on his back, his parents wrote his name his birth, like who he is okay. just didn't know living through bombings and it's it's absolutely uh yeah. Right. 
to refuse next, yeah. So crazy how how time has worked. You know, we always say like history repeats itself. I mean, the details change, but it's it's shocking that we're that these towns that were. Mm. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for starting us off like that. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna try. I'm gonna attempt today in the next 50 minutes. Yes. Oh, okay. To become numb. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I you should just know, Julie, a lot of people have been reaching out to say, is there something we could do? So, so for example, like we're, we're going to be going to Israel in a few weeks with 25 people that could take suitcases of supplies, right? So we have reached out to, to ask, like, what's needed? What could we bring with us? Like, imagine how powerful that would be to be such emissaries of, of mitzvah. But what we've been told, I've spoken to Lori Palatnik about it. I've spoke to the head of Hatzala in Israel, who's actually in the Ukraine right now, like on the ground. And it's, it's, they really just need money. There's so much stuff. There's an outpouring of kindness, but they just need to, like, it's not stuff. That stuff needs sorting and it needs manpower. And there's so much chaos. There's like over 10,000 immigrants now in Israel. Like they need to be able to go to a store and buy what they need for their families. So, which which is what we've been doing over here. I mean, we've sent a few thousand dollars. And... But maybe we should do another another drive. Or... Okay, but that that's what we've been told. I know. Yeah. So I, I was telling I was telling Julie about this last week, right when I was coming to class, I got a call from my first cousin, my first cousin in Montreal. He's a really good, nice Jewish boy. And he, he runs a shipping company. And he called me up and he said, Eve, I have a guy here that's willing to donate oh, how much was it like 3,000 tons of humanitarian supplies and medicine like like tons and my cousin was going to ship it free and he had the stuff and he had the shipping he's like just put me in touch with the right person so right away I mean I, I called Lori Platnick who put me in touch with the right person on the ground but it was I, I'm not even sure what happened with it I have to follow up but basically so complicated to even get things into the country over there so they were gonna send it to Poland where a lot of the people are, are fleeing to, right? So I don't know, it's just like, it was so exciting, right? We have like here, we have people that are ready to donate, but it's still, there's so much red tape to actually, so, you know, I, I feel like the outpouring of love and support is there. People's hearts are very on fire for humanity, for all the suffering that's going on. I don't think, we haven't become numb yet, but, Almost 
stay right here because I have to put a new glove on a new. Okay. I, I, I feel like Deborah, you're are you able to even hear what's going on? No. No, I was gonna say either pass the computer to when somebody I know, I know it's it's a problem. But we're gonna we're just gonna start our class now. I'm sorry, we, we got off on a bit of a tangent on what we could do about the situation in, in Ukraine and it's it's really upsetting and it's a really important conversation to have. And and we're just trying to make all of you online feel really bad about not being here in person with all of these gorgeous faces. So I hope you'll come next time. Yeah, sorry. No, I am sorry. It worked. That. Thank you. Working. Thank I you know. very it's much. Nice. You can see all the gorgeous like spring colors in this room. It's amazing. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to jump right in because we have a very important class to do. What I'm going to try to do is combine the Musser teachings that we've been learning for the last 20, year, 20 weeks with Pesach, Passover. Okay, I'm going to jump in with, because it's all, it's all timely. It all fits together so beautifully. So please Hashem, give me the right words and like, let me put the pieces together and um, put us on a direction for the next week and a half where we could use these, like bring this to life in our preparation. Okay, that's my hope. So, and, and then I think next week I'll probably continue along that line or we'll do a video, which I wanted to do today, but I it's hard to track this video down, but it would be a really, amazing way to bring so much of what we've been learning together and watch we'll have like movie night we'll have like popcorn and we'll get all cozy okay so that's hopefully hopefully for next week okay so I'm, I'm gonna start with one of my favorite stories and this is a story that actually took place in the ukraine in the late 1700s this is a story that my kids know it backwards and I've been I tell to them 20 times a year before Pesach comes that they could save in their sleep, but it's, it, it gives me a lot of inspiration. Okay, so let's try to connect to this story. So have you guys met my friend, Dr. Didi, who does the Jewish medical ethics, right? You, you've been going. So she's fabulous. So this is actually the story that I've been like telling over for the last decade is actually her great, great grandfather. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so his name is Rabbi Levi Yitzchak from the town of Berdichev in the Ukraine. Yeah, that's her relative. It's like her great, 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 I don't know, from the late 1700s. I did not know. No, she, when I met her the first time, she's like, yeah, and I'm like, you know, it's like name dropping, like in the Jewish world, like, yeah, I'm like related to like this rabbi and that rabbi. I, I, I seriously, I mean, I have a dozen stories that I share about him. And so this is the story. This is such a powerful story. So. The story goes like this. It's the day of Pesach, okay? All the preparation, even in the shtetl, right? It was different. Like my bubby, when she was alive, she used to, I used to talk to her like as I'm preparing for every holiday. And she would always tell me what it was like in the shtetl in Europe with the chickens that the mother was, you know, like they, they shechted their own chickens and they had like the carp in the bathtub and, you know, like for the gefilte fish, everything it was just, but it was so joyous. You know, we, we talk a lot about the devastation, but what I loved, my memories of my grandmother is the joy before the holidays. So it's the day of Pesach and all the energy that comes with it. And this very famous rabbi has many, many followers. So all his students wanted to cram into his home or his uh, Beit Midrash, wherever it was that he was doing this, to be a part of his Seder. They wanted to attach themselves to this greatness. So they're all coming as the, as the time is ticking, the sun is starting to set, light the candles. Everyone comes for the Seder of their great leader. And he sits there, regal, royal at the head of the table. So many people jammed into that room. And he says, I'm not ready to start the Seder yet. Three things I need first. They said, sure, Rebbe, anything. Anything you ask for, we'll do anything for you. So he says, I need Turkish tobacco and Persian silk scarves 
and a piece of bread. The students look at each other. They don't know, like they're thinking to themselves, has he lost his mind? Seriously, like, first of all, it's punishable by death to smuggle anything in to the Ukraine at that time, right? There's like, what, what, what are the, the police of that time? What were they called? Like, not the Gestapo's, but the, the cop, the Cossacks, okay? The Cossacks, but just a terrible time where we're literally off with your head at, at anything that you would do wrong, right? With, with all that was happening in that country at that time, you couldn't, right? So he, he, they just look at each other like, Rebbe, like, for real? And he says, I'm not starting the Seder until you go and do this. This is what my request is. Hmm. So they all go. They're just like shaking their heads like, where are we going to find these things? But they'll try for their Rebbe. So an hour passes. Two hours pass. And next to the Rebbe, the Rebbe is deep in concentration. He's learning. He's in his own mystical world. And slowly the students start trickling in. And there's a quite a small or sizable pile of Turkish tobacco on one side of the Rebbe and another decent sized pile of silk Persian scarves. And this, but the students, they're all like frustrated and chatting. I don't know, but they said, Rebbe, we, we tried, we, we searched the entire city of Radichev. We couldn't even find a crumb of hummus. So with that, he clups his hands on the table and he puts his hands up and he says, Mi ka'amcha Yisrael, who is like the Jewish people of Israel? He says, you, there could be guards on every, on every border and still people will smuggle things in. You know, what are you afraid of? Like, okay, punishable by death. But, you know, you'll still smuggle. But all it says in the Torah is bal yira'e ubal mase, that we shouldn't have chametz in our, position, our possession. We shouldn't see it and we shouldn't own it. We shouldn't eat it. Right? Those are, there's like just a few words in the Torah that say no chametz, get rid of it, no chametz, and not a speck is to be found in the whole city. He says, now I'm ready to begin my Seder. He wanted to make a statement to God and to his students. I mean, and this, this story is hundreds of years old. I mean, it definitely made an impression on my life because like, why are we doing this all, right? Memories, customs, my grandmother did it, right? Like, you know, we spoke about all the customs a few weeks ago. Like, that's why I cut off the tip of the brisket because my grandmother did it like that or because it fits into to the nine by 13 pen, really nice, right? We don't, we, where we get lost in all the whys and it, but really bottom line, since the beginning of time, the Jewish people have been keeping Passover just because of a few words that God put out there. No one is, no guards, no one's checking on us. No one's telling us how to do it or what to do. We're, we're all going to do it in our own way. But we could connect to this powerful idea over here. Like the Jewish people, we're, we're special. We are special. And if you think about all the holidays, Passover is one of the most celebrated holiday. It's, it's in the 70s. 70% 70 of the Jewish people celebrate Passover in some way or other which is much higher than any of the other holidays. And maybe, I don't know what Yom Kippur is, maybe maybe around there, but but yeah, okay? So I'm gonna start with that, with that, um, that beautiful story. And now I'm, we're gonna talk about what the work actually is, okay? What is the work that we're doing with Musser? Like, what are we actually trying to do? Like, nothing is wrong, so don't be shy. What are we trying to do? Improve, right? Okay, give me some other words. Refine, improve. We're, we're trying to grow. We're trying to change, like change traits, character traits, like all the work that we're about, that we've been doing. Okay, so now let's let's move that to Pesach. What are we supposed to be doing right now in preparation? I'm not there yet. Sue said cooking, cleaning. cleaning. Okay, so that's definitely the energy. Of the of this time, it's the preparation. Is there something we're letting go, we're getting rid of? Yeah, it's like it's like I'm getting rid of the hummus as I'm like eating like my cookie dough ice cream and that you know in the freezer. I'm like it's a mitzvah, right? My my neighbor, my I I I have this neighbor who he's always like every time I come outside, he's outside with his dog, 
Like, I think that's his full-time job. Like he's always walking the dog. Every single time I'm outside, he's outside. So he's kind of, he's such a cute man. And he's always like, so interested in what's going on. And we're like running into the car, running out of the car. We're always like, we have a very fast paced life. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, on Sunday, he walks by and there's a lot of action coming out of our garage. There's music playing. All the kids are helping. We're schlepping things. Or my son is cleaning the car. We're throwing water. There's water everywhere. Like, you know, at the garage where we are wiping down all the fridges and there's hot water and we're defrosting them. And so you could just imagine lots of action for this quiet little cul-de-sac on Exmoor Court. So he like comes by with his dog and he's, he's a nice Jewish man. So he, oh, everyone's Jewish on my street. But he said, he said, you know, Eve, I, I'm watching you and I'm thinking, God really knew what he was doing. I'm like, I mean, I, I believe so, but what do you mean? So he said, it makes so much sense. The whole world is spring cleaning now, right? And, and all, and you're doing the same thing. Everyone's getting, it's so healthy to get rid of and to clean out and to do a deep clean, right? I mean, the whole world is into spring cleaning and Mary Kondo is all about like getting rid, does this bring joy? Does this bring joy? You know, like getting like lightning, you know, but it's actually like, that is the mitzvah of the hour. So he, he was just like walking by and he's been like noticing and he keeps on looking out of his window at like all the action of comings and goings. Just wait till my husband takes out the blowtorch next week. You know, well, I'll have to invite him in. <laughs> Maybe he's never seen something like that before. But um, I mean, I, I mean, he he lived with the vegan, so who knows what he's you know. <laughs> but with the blowtorch, well, clean like there is lots of blowtorching things for like if you're cushioning metal like stainless steel, there's certain ways of cushioning that. Um, there's different ways of cushioning. So my husband is really big into that because that was his profession. He he worked in cushrus in Portland, so yeah, there's a lot of heat involved and tools and masks and gloves and burns and yeah so let's just get through this let's get through this I always just make a prayer I one era of Pesach I ended up in the in the ER the night before Pesach with a second degree burn all over my foot so I was pregnant with Tehillah I refused to take any medication because I didn't want to like you know god forbid like injure the pregnancy but the whole night I was in so much pain but it was you know, sometimes we, we lose ourselves in the preparation. I mean, that was a huge lesson for me. Like I was so exhausted and pregnant and little, little kids everywhere. And I'm hosting for so many people. And it was just, it was too much. And in my exhaustion, I tripped over the boiling water that was kashering. Yeah, that was a, a real lesson. And the crazy thing is that at the same exact moment that I tripped over the 10 gallons of water, my husband was opening a bottle of wine with a knife. I know he cut his hands. He, he, he was rushed to tear him and I was rushed to the hospital at the same time. And um, yeah, that was a piece up that I'll never forget. I had no skin on the bottom of my foot. So I was like, okay, let's move on. Okay. We have to be really careful. And it, it gets very overwhelming, right? Because there's no end to, there's no end. Right. And we, so we have to like, not lose ourselves in it. Okay, so let's just go back to what it is all about. So if we're talking about Musser as growth and change and all of that, mm -hmm. and then we're talking about this time of year, our mitzvah, the mitzvah of the hour is to get rid of. So let's try, because it's really, really possible to take the physical act that we're doing and the spiritual like mission and bring it into one. And this is called kavana. Okay, kavana is intention, okay? Now, you don't need to do anything extra to, to make something from, take something from a physical act to a spiritual act. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean you need to spend time and you don't need to go meditate on a hilltop, right? You could literally be spring cleaning your house or you could be cleaning for Pesach. One is a mitzvah, one is just something that is in the air and everyone's doing it and it feels good, right? So that's just insert a little bit of intention and all of a sudden the whole, the whole thing has changed. You're doing the, the mitzvah of the hour. Okay, so I'm gonna read you guys some ideas. This is a friend of mine, Ellen Hutt, who is an educator in Denver. She sent me a beautiful email yesterday. And um, she, she basically wrote, and I'm happy to forward it to anyone if, if you're interested, but just in a nutshell, I'll just share 
that that cleaning for Pesach, if you just have, you could bring a spiritual twist to it. So for example, doors, cleaning your doors for Pesach. I don't know if I'm going to get, what, you did clean your doors? I was just thinking, I don't know if I'm going to get to cleaning my doors, but cleaning your doors. So her her slant on it in her mind, her intention, her kavana is what is coming into my house? What influences am I letting in? Or what influ influences do I need more of in my home? Like for me, I would love to have more guests. It was a kind of a weird year with COVID. Like, are you guys coming? Are you not coming with smaller groups? Usually we, we prefer to host large amounts. So for me, maybe it's like, please God, let let our home, let our door be open to so many more in the coming months, the coming year, okay? So, so just this idea of like the door being open, being closed, what's outside and inside is the same. This is a lesson that we've learned that right, we, in Hebrew we say toho kabaro, that, that you're authentic, right? We spoke about all, we had a whole class on this, I think when we spoke about how the pig is the trephous animal because it presents as kosher, it has split hooves, but it doesn't chew its cud. So we want to make sure like the highest level of, of being a human being, like an elevated human being is to be, is to be like what's outside and inside match, that you're not being a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're happy for people to come in. Like, it's not like there's a, not another reality happening behind closed doors. Okay. So these are some ideas, some kavanot, some intentions that we could have when cleaning our door. Okay. Another one she says is the windows. This is also, she's really from, I don't know if I'm getting to my windows either. If I get my kitchen clean, that'll be amazing. But windows, if you are cleaning your windows. So she's asking for clarity in her life. Please God, give me clarity. What, which perspective do I want to choose? Because really that's what we learn over here is that it's all choice. You could choose to take the high road or the low road, right? It's all about choice. We have Bechira, that's choice, free will. So we need clarity to make good choices then cleaning mirrors, okay, mirrors, she says, how do I see myself, and what image do I want to reflect to the world, like, how do I want to show up, how do I, okay, we're all, you know, we're considered, like, the daughter of the king, like, Abbas Melech, the daughter of Hashem, how do I want to represent God in the world, right, every morning when you get dressed, you look yourself in the mirror, like, what do you see, right? Are you feeling good? Like when I walked in, I'm like, you look so pretty. You look so, everyone looks so beautiful. Like you guys put effort into how you look. You represent yourself and the Jewish people, whether you know it or not, right? So that's, so mirrors, like, how do I see myself? How do I want other people to see me, okay? Then she goes on closets. Closets, she says, what no longer is fitting me? What's outdated? What ideas? What what no longer suits me? Like if this could be dreams, what things are you holding on to that probably are not meant for you anymore? I mean, I have I, I still have like the suit that I wore to my Shabbat brachot after my wedding, right? And my husband's like, get rid of it. It's a size two. Like you're never gonna fit into it. Like you know, but I can't. Like certain things, I'm just. You totally get it. And then there's just like before pregnancy and after pregnancy and. So, but on, that's on a physical level. We all know what that's like on a physical level to hold on to physical things just in case, right? It's very normal. But, but now on a spiritual level, what are we holding on to that's not serving us well? It could be grudges, right? It could be negativity. I don't know, someone hurt you. Like, when are you ready to let it go? I'm gonna share two powerful stories in a minute about um, that, that Alan Marinus talks about letting go, okay? So- so that's the closets, um, like, and also like, so there's the bad that you wanna get rid of, things that don't suit you. And then there's also treasures. What have I overlooked? Who have I, have I overlooked, right? This is a, a beautiful process to go through. So, so I just read this today, but I started really scrubbing on Sunday when we were cleaning the fridges. And I, I like, I was down on my knees and I'm scrubbing with a, with like, chemical and trying to get like stains out of the bottom of the fridge and and Gadi came in and he was like okay Eve, why don't you go do that and I'll I'll take over but you know like when you're in the zone so I'm like no I'm good I'm good but there was there's something very what's the word cathartic about it because if you really all you need to do is attach 
the Havana, the intention that this is not about cleaning the fridge. This is about working out my own schmutz, my own gunk. We all have it, right? So what do we want to, like, just, I mean, this could be done at every age and I guess age appropriately at different stages, but, but even for children to kind of understand that if there's stuff, there's bad traits that they need to let go of. So like to loosen it, it's, it's amazing. It, this is an amazing exercise. It really is. So anyway, she goes on and on refrigerator. She says, what are you filling yourself with? Is it, is it um, like empty calories, like candy and garbage? Or are you nourishing yourself with something real, something meaningful, like insights, wisdom? Like what are you filling your head with? Are you filling your head with, with something that will lift you up? and really nourish you because otherwise, right, when we just eat garbage and candy, we're never full. So if you look at the world today, most people are like looking for something and they'll put like another crazy thing on them and another crazy idea and another, like, because we're never full. So we're always looking for the next fix, right? So, so this is like, what can I do to really satiate my deepest self? Right? So that's like the refrigerator and the freezer and the pantry. Like what's, what's going on? Like what's spoiling in the back that needs to be gotten rid of, right? We could, we could make our own parallels. Um, she says the tubs, the showers, the sinks. She says um, there are situations, challenges, perspectives. I just need to let go of and wash away. Just like wash it down the sink. Like when you're, her name is Ellen Hutt. Yeah, you can look her up. She actually wrote a book. And I'm not sure what it's called, but she's a fabulous human being. H U T and maybe T T, but Ellen Hutt. And yeah, I feel like you would really connect well with her. She's like, you, you, you're very, it's good stuff, right? It's good analogies. And then the last one she, she wrote is the floors. The floors I walk on represent the habits and routines that shape my day to day life. Like, just it's like where we are always, like we're always treading that those same floors. Am I living on autopilot in a rote fashion? Are there habits that I need and want to change to revitalize my life? So this is her little take on spirituality, spirituality and Pesach. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in with a little bit of where we left off last week. And I'm gonna share two stories that Alan Marinus shares okay so I'll, I'll start with the second one the second one i feel goes yeah yeah yeah. it's on page 42 okay i'm finishing actually part one of the book today so and then we, we're going to jump around because last week we didn't really finish the chapter so so just bear with me because there's a few parts that we didn't get to last week so i just want to complete it and then after pesach we're going to start part two which is the map which goes through unique character traits so we'll do like a trade every week Okay, so just to finish, so there's two stories I'm going to share. So one is one of his students, his name is Rob, who found himself caught in a very difficult situation that is unfortunately very common. There's a, a question that I've asked um, in some of our groups. Was anyone at the, I, I, you, you ladies might have been, Lauren, you were there at the, the last Woman, Wine and Wisdom. Were, were you there when we did that really powerful group not the masks, the other one where stand up for your sister. So basically one of the, so I ask questions where no one's answering for themselves. Everyone is answering for, for someone else because everyone's written it down. So one of the questions is, do you do not speak to a family member? And unfortunately this question gets a very high stand up rate. Like a lot of people have what, what's the word? Estranged? Yeah. Estranged relationships in their closest, closest family. So here is a story. I know. I mean, so we, we all, I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's in every family. And, and we want to, you know, you know, that story, like you want to change the world, like, you know, and then you have to start like, well, maybe change your family, maybe, maybe first change yourself. It's actually the hardest place is to start with your family, right? That's so hard. But yes, I'm with you. So that question. So here is a story. One of one of Alan Marinus's Musser students is a man that for 25 years did not speak to his father, okay? 25 years it took him, and he's a student of Musser, 
But it took time to realize that what he's learning in the books and sources directly correlated to his situation. And it was when he studied the topic of generosity, which we would think is money or time, right? Like to give of yourself. That's when he realized, wait, there's generosity of spirit. He could go above and beyond his comfort and extend, graciously extend an apology to his father that has been estranged to him for his entire life. His father had never met his child that was 25 years old. Okay. So this is, I'll just read you just a few. And, and it's such a stupid thing. Like, I mean, it seems stupid to me, but who knows what was behind it. But over here, they're saying that when he was ready to have his first child's bris mila, Okay. And we know emotions soar during times of simchas, right? There's so much that goes on behind the scenes. It brings up a lot for people. We get it. But he goes to his father and he said, I, I know you don't have a good relationship with my in-laws, but I'm just asking you to behave. And that, that was it. That was it. The father didn't go to the bris, his own grandchild's bris, and never spoke to his son again. And here is this Jewish man that's studying Musa, trying to better himself. And it clicked for him. It literally, he says, a light went on, right? They're talking about the soul trait of generosity. And a light went on, confronted by the Musa understanding of generosity, which entails stretching yourself to give beyond the boundaries of the comfortable or the usual, right? And that's when something new opened up for him. And he, he gets back together with his father right? And, and he says, it says over here, Musser for him opened a way to healing inwardly and in relationship. It provided Rob with the tools he needed to free himself from the dictates of his primitive grudge-bearing nature and to entrust the governance of his life to, to his higher self, the soul. And the soul seeks shlemut. Shlemut means, does anyone know what that word is? What's shlemut? Wholeness. Good. Okay. And let's talk about that word for a second. Shlemut. It's the same word as shalom, right? Shalom means peace or, you know, we say shalom, hello, goodbye. Shalom, peace, right? Which we know. And that's the root of shlemut. It's the same word. Shlemut is completion. Before Shalema have a complete healing, okay, a, a speedy and complete uh, refuah, good, okay, so Shlemu, okay, that's when he realized there was something missing, so here is my little take on this word, on Shlemu, okay, now the word Shalom, right, my son's name, Shalom, so, and we, we named him that in the hope that he was gonna bring like peace into our home because it was a crazy house at that time, like having our sixth kid or like, he is gonna be called Shalom. He is gonna bring in the peace. So, so what I didn't realize, and I probably shared this with you in one of our classes. So he was born hearing impaired and it took a couple of weeks until he was diagnosed as completely deaf in one ear. And we had, we had a whole road ahead of us to navigate this like single-sided deafness and, and I, I was just, well, first I went through denial and then I, I, I mean, I cried. I thought like, I just saw black, right? But I realized that the name that we gave him at his bris when we didn't even know, I mean, they told us in the hospital they couldn't get, there was no connection from day two in that year, but I thought, oh, it'll just take a couple days. So, and I, I was totally in denial. But when he was eight days old, we chose that name, Shalom, which means whole, complete. And that was the strength that I needed to know that everything, he has everything he needs mm -hmm. to succeed. He's complete, exactly how Hashem made him. He has all the tools he needs to be the most successful him that he needs to be, okay? So here is a lesson about Shlemut, okay? Or Shalom or Shalom bias, like, like harmony in the home. That peace is, and this is, uh, this is what you learned. You probably learned it when you were on um, the last trip. We talk about peace is only, it's only a thing in a place where there was fragmentation. When, the, when everything is great, I mean, it's great. But when is it amazing when there's shalom bias, when there's harmony in the home? Because there was strife before and you fixed it. 
that's when peace really, really is so important. So for example, the, the example that, that I learned from Ruchi Koval, she says like, if you make a puzzle, okay? Like anyone here into puzzles, like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And it's, it's put together and you're so proud of it that you modge podge it and you hang it up on your wall and it's there. And, and so from afar, it looks like, you know, it just looks like a picture from afar. But as you come closer, you see there are thousands or a thousand little, little pieces that came together. It's so much more impressive, right? So that's shalom, okay? It's only in a place where there is fragmentation that when you could come back together, that is greatness. So that's what this is over here, okay? This shlimut that we're all going about, going towards is so, so huge because our world and our lives and our inner self, we are fragmented people. So when we could overcome something that is broken, it's like kintsugi, the Japanese art, right? When you, it's when a piece of pottery is broken, you fill the crack in with silver or gold, and now it becomes a much more value, valuable vessel, right? So that is how all of our lives are. When we could fix something, we're so much better off than when we than when before we started. Okay, let's read the second story. The second story is oh my gosh, this one for all of you. I'm looking at you, whoever has teenage kids. So okay, Laura, you're in the hot seat. You also, you also. Okay, so it could be challenging, right? <laughs> it's like an understatement. Okay, so as we say, you either give birth to your homework or you marry it, right? So here, and, and the kids, or especially teens, especially in 2020, could really push buttons. So here is a Musser student. Her issue is anger. She lashes out. She has no filter. She just, like, something happens. She gets aggravated, annoyed, and she literally cannot control herself. And she knows that she's destroying her relationship with her teen. She knows that it's not only now that she's destroying in the moment, but she's destroying the future, right? Like if, she, if you have such a toxic mother-child relationship, it's not good. Nobody wants that, but she can't control herself. So then she has her epiphany that, and she's a Musser student. So it's all nice in a book and taking notes and showing up to classes, but here she, and this is years and years of studying Musser. So this is such a beautiful story where she realized that she had the tools. So this is the predicament. Um, she, her daughter, who she usually like, even in a, it's not such a bad scenario, she usually jumps down her daughter's throat. Like she's just so, it's a toxic relationship. So her daughter is painting the room and the daughter spills the, 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 the can of paint all over the cream carpet. Okay. Yeah. So what's coming? I mean, right. Like, I mean, this, what could be worse, right? Right in front of the mother, all over the carpet. So, so there was, so be cleaned. Mother, what did you say? It can be cleaned. It can be cleaned. I mean, maybe it has to be changed. I don't know. Maybe not cleaned. everything could be fixed or cleaned. It's happened to you. Be cleaned. It's happened to you. Nadine, I wish, I mean, not that I wish you were my mother, but I do remember, I have this memory when I dyed my hair red when I was 14 years old and it looked like it looked like a murder scene mm -hmm. on the cream carpet like the, the dye in the, in the hallway near the bathroom oh my gosh like you needed earplugs to like the decibel was really really yeah she was mad mad at me okay but we've worked that out so over here this lady Marianne she says she sees the, the paint all over the floor seeping into the carpet and before me, in my mind, this is so amazing, two doors. There's two doors in front of her. This is like her visual, visualization. One door was really familiar. It was well used. And behind it, she saw herself screaming, saying the worst things, you clumsy idiot, like, and a lot more, okay? That was like the door that she would always take. It was just no filter. Just see what you want and regret it later. And then there was a new door. She's never seen this door before. And behind it, she saw herself saying, what a mess. Let's clean it up. 
And she saw in that moment that she had a choice. The choice was hers. Isn't that amazing? Like imagine in a moment, I mean, we all, the second. So, so that's why we're not supposed to react. We're supposed to like something happens, take a deep breath, go get a, get a cup of water, like just a few seconds to think about your reaction before you react, right? A little bit of time kind of eases the pain, calms you down, take a walk around the block, whatever you need to do. But very often we don't let ourselves do, to do that. But this is a lady that has been learning Musser for years. So she didn't realize she was a master of it. She just never applied it to her life. And all of a sudden, like this was the game changer. She saw she had a choice. Okay, so love this. And, and also like it goes on to say over here that Musser differs from self-help. This is not self-help. It encourages you to do all this, not in order to gratify some as yet unfulfilled personal and worldly desire, but because this is the path you must walk in order to bring the soul to wholeness, shlemut, and holiness, right? The soul yearns for something more elevated than what we give it and what we feed it on the physical level. The soul wants that, that word again, shlemut, completion, wholeness. And that's, you're not going to get that without, like, there has to, it's an elevated status, right? It's, it's something that is not easily attainable. Totally, totally. Give me, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, in the moment, in the moment she's in complete turmoil, right? Right, like in the moment, right? Until she gets, like until she made her choice. Like that split second where you could easily go the wrong way is probably a hard moment. But once you get past it, like, I mean, how, how a million bucks. And you know that now you could do that again. Like you've just, it's all about muscle memory. Like that's why, that's why, you know, if you have a thousand dollars that you want to give to charity, it's more preferable, right? Is that, is that how you say it? It's preferable to give $1,000 bills to 1,000 organizations, right? But why? Because wouldn't it be more helpful to just give a thousand dollars to an individual or to an organization and actually be able to help them? Why does Maimonides tell us that it's good to give small amounts to so, so many? It's because it's not about the charity. It's about you. You're trying to become the best person that you could become. And that takes like exercise. So you're, you're creating muscle memory in giving, giving. You're becoming a giver, except when it comes to L'chaim and then you should give it all over here. <laughs> just joking, just joking. But do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's an interesting thing. Like, God doesn't need our charity. He, he could take care of all the poor people in the world. But he wants us to change. He wants us to become godlike, all giving, all loving, compassionate human beings. He wants us to see outside of our little bubbles. Otherwise, it would be a terrible, sad state of the world. Right? I, I mean, I had such a beautiful experience yesterday. Going back to the story that I started off with, Mika Amcha Yisrael, who is like your, your people of Israel? So the story is that I teach a bat mitzvah class on Sundays and there's girls from all over the world. We have a girl, it's mother's daughters. So we have from Italy, from Israel, from Canada, from all over the States. We've had from Mexico. So we had this one mother daughter. I think they live in South Bend, Indiana. Okay. I don't know what the Jewish community is like over there. It's probably very small. But, but chances are from this story sounds very special. So here's a lady that's coming in with her daughter. She's very new to Judaism. And she, she shared, we were talking about kindness and chesed and this and that, and, and she got like really choked up. She said, I'm, I'm, I've never had a kosher home. And the community, they, they showed up. I, I said, I'd be open to it. And five ladies showed up in my house and helped me kosher my house and gave me all the money I needed to buy new appliances, 
and whatever she needed to switch over plates, cutlery, this, that, whatever. They said, they, they set me up for success. Like, I, she's like, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm not used to this. And she said that, so that was like two, three months ago. So the ladies, they called her up this week and they said, um, we just wanted to know how you're doing your new kosher kitchen and what your plans are for Pesach. So she's like, I haven't thought about Pesach. So they said, well, we, we kind of anticipated that. So when we, when we had some money for you, we put aside some for you to also be able to have what you need. I mean, I, she was choked up. We were, everyone was choked up because, and those are the words that I said, Mika Amcha Yisrael, who is like this people? We're so interesting. Like we are so giving and loving and we really care to give her time and to help someone like step up in that way. It was so beautiful. Right? Talk about going out of your way to really be there for someone else. Okay, so um, we, it's almost 12 and I really wanted to finish. Could we just spend five minutes um, going through some of the things that we forgot to mention last week so that we could, we could really finish this part of the, of the book, okay? So, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? So do you remember last week, for some of you were here, some of you were not here, but um, last week, the chapter was actually about like how to navigate the way, like how different ways of studying. And like there's text study, there's meditation, there's retreating, right? We spoke about that, that idea of which is kind of going out on by yourself in a private place and just talking to God and just being alone and retreating, like those beautiful practices that make this real. It takes introspection. So we need to carve out a little bit of time. We spoke about the idea that daily practices of taking an accounting for your actions, cheshbon hanefesh. Okay, so we, we spoke about some of those ideas last week. Um, I, I might've mentioned there's chanting, contemplations, visualizations, all of these, things that we do, that some Jews do, different Jews will attach themselves to different ways of taking an inspirational idea and really bringing it into their whole being, like how to really make it a part of you, okay? So, so some of the things that I didn't share. So one is um, a story of Rabbi, Rabbi Salantar. He was the forefather of the Musar movement. And do you know what year? I mean, was that the 1600s? Rabbi Yisrael Sons, pretty a long time ago. I'm pretty sure 1600s. So this is the story. He is trying to get a roof in his town repaired. It was a the, it was a poor house. So it was a place where where people needed a shelter. They would stay there. And the town repairmen and the elders, ah, people were dragging their feet. They just weren't getting around to it. So Rabbi Salanter himself went to sleep with the beggars under the dilapidated roof. And he was a very important prestigious figure, but until they were not listening to him. So he was like, you know what? I'm setting up camp. He stayed there. Yeah, wait, 1810? Okay, okay, thank you. 18, 1800s. So no, so but I, I'm wondering what the, it would be really interesting to see the lineage, like how it, how it goes, like, from, from the Musser. I mean, Musser has been going on for a thousand years, but I guess he was one of the forefathers. Like he actually took it down and wrote it and yeah. So, so, he, so he's under this dilapidated roof until people really said, okay. Like, so basically he, he was like, what he was doing, he summed it up by saying that caring for the needs of others can be undertaken as a spiritual practice. So he said, a pious Jew is not one who worries about his fellow man's soul and his own stomach. A pious Jew worries about his own soul and his fellow man's stomach. This is so important because like we could be so righteous like, uh, you know, like, oh, look, look what he's doing. Like, we could be so concerned. Like, look at his soul. I mean, he just, he should go take a muster class. Like, he needs to change. We're, we're so judgmental on other people that really, the only thing we should really be concerned with 
is how they're doing. We don't need to worry about their spirituality. We need to worry about their physicality. So this is something that, that when it comes to Pesach, there's a lot of physical work. I remember one of my teachers, this is years ago when I had so many little, little kids. And I said to her, I can't, like, I don't even have the headspace to sit and to open the Chumash and to learn. Like, I feel so disconnected. I, I can't even go to synagogue on, on Rosh Hashanah to pray. I have nursing babies. I was so overwhelmed. And she said, don't worry. The time will come. You'll be back in, in services. You'll be praying in a shul. But for now, your spirituality is their physicality. It's so important. So that's what, what he did over here. His spiritual work was to get the roof fixed because he couldn't live with the fact that it was dripping on his fellow Jews. Okay, so don't worry about how they're doing between them and God. Yeah, talk about the roof. Judy, she's been working day and night. Okay, so one or two more, more little ideas. Okay, so here is, this is such a good one. So talking about change. So, so this great sage, the altar of Navarda, he said, the problem with people is that they want to change overnight and have a good night's sleep that night too. Isn't that great? So, um, so I'm just going to really just finish up with maybe one more. Okay, I'll finish up with this being that it's spring outside. So this is um, a student of the Mir Yeshiva in Poland. So had a very close relationship with the Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Yerucham Levavit. So this story, this is a true story. One beautiful spring day when a group of boys gathered in his house, in the Rosh Yeshiva's house, to study Musar, the Mashkiach, the, the, you know, the spiritual leader, rushed into the room and had a very agitated look on his face. The Mashkiach then cried out, I just came from the street and I saw that all around me, everything was growing. Why are we not growing? Ever since that day, whenever I get warm and comfortable, I could hear the Mashkiach's words roaring at me. Why aren't you growing? So I think well, we're going to end here, but when we go out into the beautiful spring day and Pesach always falls on spring, so there's so much to be aware of on the physical world, but also on a spiritual way. If every blade of grass is blooming right now, maybe this is our opportunity to also grow inside, grow the most beautiful inside, ex interior, interior and exterior. So I will, I'll, I think I'm going to end here. And I think we've got most of this done for, for part one and we'll continue with part two after Pesach. But next week we will have class and it's going to be a special class, okay? And also for any of you that may not know, tonight we have um, a cooking demo, 7.30. Anyone is welcome to come at this point, whether you've signed up or not. Oh, is it seven or 7.30? Tonight, 7.30, right? 7.30. Yeah, so everyone is welcome. It's gonna be here. Yeah, yeah, Julie is printing the books. Oh. Thank you, Eve. It's Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Good to see you. I Bye, have everybody. To... Is my cousin there? Yeah, she's right here. Hannah. Hi. Oh, I see Paula. Hi, Paula. Miss Hi, you. Bobby. How are you? Miss Good you. Girl. When are you coming home? When I feel like it. Ask for Gina. <laughs> I feel like it. Okay, we'll see. see you later. Bye. Bye, -bye guys. Hi, Nadine. Hi, how are you? See Hi, you. good to see you. See you tonight. Okay, well, are you coming tonight? Yes. Oh, I'm so excited. Yay. Happy spring, but there's going to be some more snow. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Just, just wanted you to know who's in charge. I was just ready to put away my um, boots, boots and coats, but I, I maybe I'll Not wait yet. On. Not yet. Take care. We'll see you tonight. Hi, Joyce. Okay. How are you? Hey, Joyce, you're you're muted, but it's good to see that you're on. Be in touch. Bye, everybody. Bye.